Assalamu alaikum students and welcome to your ophthalmology clerkship video sessions. Today we will be talking about retinal detachment which is our final differential diagnosis in the theme of sudden and painless loss of vision. The things that we will talk about today are the structure and function of the relevant part of the eye which is the retina. Uh, the definition of retinal detachment, types of retinal detachment, how these patients present and an overview of management. Management is highly specialized and in, enough information has been provided here so that once you are able to establish that the patient has a retinal detachment or one of the stages of retinal detachment, you are able to sort of inform the patient as to what comes next as you refer him to a specialist. So the relevant anatomy is obviously of the retina and our area of interest is the junction between the neural retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. Now the nine neural layers have tight junctions amongst them and are sort of tightly adherent to one another. But the neural layer and the RPE are not joined by tight junctions. They are just held together by movement of fluid and by interdigitations between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. If we see this picture, this electron microscopic picture, these black arrow indicates part of the retinal pigment epithelium that interdigitate with these photoreceptors, which in these case are cones, uh, illustrated by CE. And these are the cone cells that are interdigitating with extensions of the RPE indicated by the black arrows. This together with the movement of fluid are the two major forces that keep the neural layers of the retina adherent to the RPE. And this is important and we are talking about this is because of what retinal detachment is. And retinal detachment is separation of the neural retina from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. It is not the detachment or separation of the retina from the choroid that is called pigment epithelium detachment. Retinal detachment is separation of the neural layers of the retina from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. And these are the types of retinal detachment, regmatogenous, which is the most common, tractional and exudative. We'll start off by talking about regmatogenous retinal detachment. And regmatogenous retinal detachment is something that forms because of a break in the retina. And that break is called a regma. And what happens is you get a break in the peripheral retina, generally in the peripheral retina, because the peripheral retina is thin. And through that break, you have liquefied vitreous moving in, which causes a separation of the neural retina from the underlying pigment epithelium. Uh, the usual age of presentation is between 40 and 70 years. The mean age is 60, and it's usually a unilateral condition. The risk factors include advancing age, myopia, uh, together with other types of retinal degeneration, including lattice, previous ocular surgery, connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome and ocular trauma. There are other risk factors, but these are the ones that are sort of at the top of the list. So let's talk about how a regmatogenous retinal degeneration occurs. And we basically need two things, a break and some form of a fluid moving in through the break. So the break may form because of two major reasons. Reason one is you have vitreous traction. And vitreous traction is because of this vitreous detachment. And that can happen either because of aging. As you age, your vitreous sort of changes from a gel to a more liquidy configuration, and it starts to contract and degenerate. And as it is contracting, it tends to separate from the areas where it is tightly adherent to the retina, which are two places, either around the optic disc or at the very periphery of the retina. And as it is separating from the periphery of the retina, where the retina is thin, and the vitreous is also tightly adherent to the retina, and as the vitreous is trying to separate itself from the retina, it might pull the retina with it, causing a formation of a break. Trauma causes a vitreous uh, traction in a very similar way, i.e. by detachment, where rather than aging, the stimulus now is the trauma, the force of the trauma, which causes the vitreous to detach. And if during that detachment, it pulls the peripheral retina as it is separating from the peripheral retina, it can cause a break to occur. The other major way a uh, break can happen is by excessive retinal thinning. And one example of excessive retinal thinning is pathologic myopia. If you remember from our discussion on refractive errors, pathologic myopia is an axial myopia. It's also called degenerative myopia, when the amount of axial myopia is usually six diopters or more, which results in excessive stretch on the coats of the eyeball, the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. That excessive stretch leads to thinning, 
And as the retina thins, it is already very sensitive neural tissue. It can develop a break. Now, together with pathologic myopia, you might also have lattice degeneration. Lattice degeneration can also occur in, in isolation of uh, pathologic myopia. And in that case, what you see are sort of uh, areas of localized retinal thinning, which appears as sort of white lines. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a bit. And they have uh, sort of a, you know, higher incidence between 6 and 8 percent. But of all of these reasons, they don't necessarily always lead to a retinal detachment. Remember, they're all risk factors, as we just talked about in the previous slide. The third cause of retinal thinning is a connective tissue disease. And this connective tissue disease is, again, causing weakness of connective tissues of the eye, leading to an elongated eyeball, which causes retinal thinning and a potential formation of a break in the peripheral retina. Now, once a break is formed, a break it by itself is not going to detach the retina. You need some form of a liquid, which is liquefied vitreous in this case, to move in through the break to separate the neural retina from the RPE. Then you get a regmatogenous retinal detachment. So this is what lattice looks like, these crisscross white lines, which are areas of localized retinal uh, thinning. This is the mechanism by which uh, vitreous detachment causes a retinal break. And as the vitreous is detaching from the peripheral retina where it is tightly adherent, rather than cleanly separating from the retina, it pulls the retina with it, which is indicated by the white arrow. And liquefied vitreous can move in through the break to separate the neural retina from the underlying RPE. These two pictures show how retinal thinning leads to a break, which is shown in A, that the retina just thinned out enough that it just broke from there creating a break in itself, liquefied vitreous moving in through the break B, and then C is the neural layer separated from the underlying RPE, and this is what the regmatogenous retinal detachment is. So the pathogenesis involves or can be constructed of uh, three different events or three different stages. There's a pre-break stage in which you have retinal thinning or retinal traction. Uh, traction is because of vitreous uh, detachment. So this is the pre-break stage. The break hasn't happened, but all the forces that cause the break are now working. Then you have the break formation, and because of whatever was uh, active during the pre-break stage, vitreous traction uh, because of vitreous uh, detachment or retinal thinning leads to a formation of a break. And then finally, you have a retinal detachment because liquefied vitreous moved in through your break. And even if you have a break without liquefied vitreous or fluid moving in through that break, you won't get a detachment. And that fluid that moves in between the neural retina and the RPE is called subretinal fluid. And that is the fluid that, drain, that detaches the uh, neural retina from the RPE. Now, this is important because there are many young myopes who have degenerative myopia in which you have a break formation, but the vitreous is still of a gel-like consistency and wouldn't move through the break. So you would get a break, but no detachment. And the detachment only occurs once you have the fluid moving in through the break, causing a separation of the neural retina from the underlying RPE. Um, so how do these patients present? Patient presentation would depend upon the stage at which they are when they come to you. They can be at a pre-break stage where the symptoms are of uh, attraction on the retina. They can come to you during a break stage and the symptoms are those of something moving through the break into the vitreous cavity uh, or, or when the retina was, uh, when the when 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 the break was created in the retina, and if there was a blood vessel running on the area where the break is created, and the blood the blood vessel is also torn together with the break, blood cells might come out. So those two things produce symptoms of the break stage. And finally, you have symptoms of the detachment stage, and that detachment stage symptoms are basically some form of visual loss. But remember, this detachment would only occur when a fluid moves in through the break, separating the neural retina from the RPE. So what are the pre-break symptoms? They are basically flashes, and flashes are because attraction, either in the form of thinning or vitreous detachment, acts as a stimulus on the photoreceptors, and the photoreceptors fire off, produces flashes, and these flashes are very similar to camera flashes or tube light as it is turning on. You know, one of those older tube lights that has a starter and takes a little bit of time to turn on. Uh, break stage symptoms are basically floaters. And remember, we said that either something can move in through the break into the vitreous cavities, and those are pigment cells from the RPE. Remember, once a break occurs, 
it, the fluid is moving between the neural retina and the RPE and the RPE is now exposed. First it was covered by neural retina and now it's not because the retina has detached from there and through the break, RPE pigment, pigment cells from the retinal pigment epithelium can move into the vitreous cavity, reducing flow risk for the patient. And if by chance there was a blood vessel running in the area where the break was created on the retina, that blood vessel would be torn and blood cells would come out into the vitreous, which would again appear to the patient as floaters. The break stage, uh, the sorry, the detachment stage produces symptoms of painless loss of vision or visual field. And it's been described by patients as a curtain coming in front of their eye. And the extent and the, the size of the curtain would depend upon how much of the retina has detached, which might cause just a loss of visual field or visual field and visual acuity, depending if the fovea is attached or not, or all of the vision might be lost if all of the retina is detached. And not all retinal detachments would produce an RAPD. An RAPD is produced when more than 55% of your retina is not responding to visual stimulus. It does not depend which 55%, i.e. fovea, macular, extramacular. Pupillary responses are mass responses. They just want light coming in from some part of the retina in order to initiate that response, irrespective of what that wear on the retina. So they are oblivious to the wear part. It's just how much of the retina is sending a signal. And if more than 55% of your retina is detached, is not sending a signal back, you would have an RAPD if it's a unilateral detachment. For more information about RAPD, you can refer to the pupillary skills clinical uh, video that we have made for you. Something that's very interesting and is also seen uh, in a regmatogenous, regmatogenous retinal detachment and is sort of important uh, when you're examining uh, a patient of a pediatric age is the white pupillary reflex or leukocoria. We'll talk more about white pupillary reflex or leukocoria when we talk about retinoblastoma um, because it's a really important uh, differential uh, in, in, in pediatric ophthalmology, because there's a lot of, there are a lot of conditions that would produce a white pupillary reflex, of which one is regmatogenous retinal detachment. And in this particular instance, it happens because the subretinal fluid blocks the red reflex, and thus you get a white pupillary, white pupillary reflex or leukocoria when doing ophthalmoscopy. Um, this is how it appears. And again, this is a child whom we are looking at because as I said, it's an important uh, differentiating features of several diseases that present with a white pupil or leukocoria in children. Uh, it is more important in children because children simply don't give a history, especially if they're pre-verbal, it's impossible to take a, a history from a child. So you're dependent upon whomever is bringing in the child and even they themselves are not always sure uh, as to what happened that brought about this condition because most of the time the child could be not with the with the parents or the guardians. So an important differential, uh, especially in children, is the white pupillary reflex. And one of the causes of a white pupillary, white pupillary reflex is regmatogenous retinal detachment. So this is a picture of a patient who has a break right here, but no detachment associated with it. So he would present with symptoms of pre-break. He would say, oh, I used to have flashes and now I have floaters. So history of pre-break symptoms and break symptoms. He might have missed the uh, pre-break symptoms altogether. They might be happening while he was sleeping or he was in a brightly lit room. So he couldn't really appreciate those flashes and he just came in with a history of floaters. So you need to take that into account that these patients might have totally missed the uh, flash uh, symptoms of a pre-break stage simply because they were sleeping when that happened, they weren't aware of it, they didn't pay attention to it, but now they're presenting you with floaters uh, but a detachment hasn't taken place. So their major symptoms is I see a lot of floaters and people usually say they're like little flies in front of my eyes or little mosquitoes in front of my eyes. And there are many of them because a lot of pigment cells and if a blood vessel is torn, a lot of blood cells will come. So they, they will say tens and hundreds of little things are flying in front of my eyes. So these are pictures of retinal detachment. We have seen the one on left before when we were talking about uh, eye trauma. And these are two retinal breaks leading to a localized retinal detachment, superior retinal detachment. And you see that the fovea is still attached. So this patient would complain of a visual field loss and an inferior field loss because this is a superior detachment, but the visual acuity would be well preserved. He would have good visual acuity. Why inferior? You can go back and refer to the discussion on 
open angle glaucoma because we discussed uh, in a lot of detail how images are formed on the retina. In brief, images on the retina are vertically and horizontally inverse. So a superior retinal detachment will result in an inferior field loss. This is a rather large break as outlined by this white area here, leading to a rather large detachment. And the fovea is also detached here, leading to a loss of visual field as well as visual acuity. And again, because this is a superior detachment, he would complain of an inferior field loss together with poor visual acuity. This is a close-up picture of the tear, uh, the break, uh, to be more precise, that uh, caused the retinal detachment. Uh, this is a demonstration of how a curtain, or what that curtain coming in front of the visual field uh, actually might look like. So this is what patients usually say that this is just a curtain coming in and the size and the extent of the curtain would depend and the location of this curtain would depend upon where the retina has detached from and how much of the retina has detached. So you might have a superior field loss, inferior field loss, temporal or nasal, all of field loss uh, depending upon the amount of retina detached and from where has the retina detached. And obviously, as you can see in this picture, if I were to show you again, this is the object of interest. So this is the patient's fovea. And in this case, the fovea seems to be attached, not, it's not a part of the retinal detachment. The retinal detachment, because this is a superior field loss, so it's the inferior retina that has probably detached. The, the basic principles of management, uh, if your patient presents with a regmatogenous retinal detachment, uh, for all of the three techniques that we talked about or we mentioned in the previous slide are the same, i.e. locate and close all breaks, drain or remove the fluid which has caused the neural retina to separate from the RPE and provide some, some form of support to the retina because remember if a retina has developed a break in an area that was because that area was weak and it is possible that that area might develop more breaks or this break that you have sort of located and closed or if there is more than one more than one break that you have located and closed might open up again because the retina sort of lacked support so you need to provide support to the retina at the point of breaks so there are three approaches as we talked about and all of those three approaches help to fix the retina which is as we also talked about is called retinopexy and you can also combine these approaches the first and the oldest method was called scleral buckling and retinopexy was done by using cold or cryotherapy, which is then called cryopexy. This is also called the external approach because the entire procedure of the detachment repair is done externally without entering the eye. And the buckle is a thing that provides support or tamponade uh, to the area of weakness. The second approach, which is rather newer, is called, well, it's also it's also very old now, but newer as compared to the buckling procedure is called parse planar vitrectomy. And now the retinopexy is usually done with laser. This is also called an internal approach because the entire process of repair is done internally from within the eye. And the tamponade is provided by using expansal gas or silicon oil, which is injected into the eye in the vitreous cavity. The third is pneumatic retinopexy, and it's a very interesting outdoor procedure for very small breaks. It was it is very popular in the US, but it's also practiced in other parts of the world, including Pakistan. So let's talk about the first procedure, which is buckling with cryopexy. This is the oldest method of repair and still in expert hands produces very good results. And what we do is we use cold or cryoburns to seal the area around the break that caused the retinal detachment. And we are using cold burns, like, you know, cold can cause burns, trench foot, frostbite things. And the buckle are silicon bands and they are tight from outside. It's like your belts that you put in your pants that hold the pants in place. So this buckle is holding the retina in place uh, where it is weak. And uh, the subretinal fluid that is collected is drained externally by using a 1cc needle and creating a little uh, opening in the sclera all the way down to the area of the detachment so that the fluid can drain out. Let's visually review all these steps. So the first step is to locate all the breaks that you do by using a special type of an ophthalmoscope called an indirect ophthalmoscope. And once you have located a break, we seal it by applying a cryoprobe on the outside from the scleral side, and we produce multiple rows of cold burns around the break, just like we were sealing 
uh, the bricks with a laser as we saw when we saw the picture in which a brick was sealed without a detachment. We, uh, multiple rows of laser were applied around the brick. So multiple cold burns are applied around the brick externally from the scleral side like so. Uh, this is how it would actually look. You see a little bit of ice forming on the sclera where the probe is acting and this this cold is transferred ex from the external part of the eye all the way down to the RPE and that cold basically creates a cold burn like uh, a frostbite in the eye to fuse the RPE to the uh, underlying uh, choroid. Um, and this is the buckle part. The buckle part is the tamponade or the support part. It's like, like you hold your pants with a, with, a, with, a, with a belt. So this buckle is going to provide support to the area of the brick that was just sealed so it doesn't open up and also to, you know, sort of uh, as, as a security against future breaks from forming because remember the retina is weak in this area, it might form breaks later. So it is passed under the extraocular muscles as shown here. This red area is an extraocular muscle and is secured by sutures to the sclera. Once you have these two things, you can create a sclerotomy, an opening in the sclera using a 1cc needle to drain the subretinal fluid, uh, i.e. the vitreous that actually cause this detachment. So this is a freshly applied cryotherapy around a break, and this is what happens after four to eight, eight weeks once it has sort of uh, fibrosed uh, and, and the, the bond between uh, the RP and the choroid is sort of now complete. The second method we talked about is pars planar vitrectomy, and as the name suggests, it means entering into the eye through the pars planar. A very safe place to enter as we have talked before when we were talking about intravitreal injections because there are no neural elements and very little vasculature. In this case, we enter into the eye through the pars plana uh, and do vitrectomy. Vitrectomy means obviously cutting up of the vitreous by a vitrector. And because this vitreous is the fluid that caused the detachment by moving in through the break and separating the neural retina from the RPE, uh, we seal the breaks uh, using laser and this is very similar, in fact, similar to uh, sealing the brakes in setting off a brake without uh, retinal detachment that we uh, saw a picture of uh, just a few slides ago, multiple rows of laser applied around a brake so as to fuse the RPE to the choroid so that the brake does not lead to a detachment here. Once you have removed the vitreous, you can seal the brake by applying laser uh, around it multiple rows just so that new fluid can't move in through. Because remember, we need to provide tamponade. We have cut away all the vitreous, so we need to put something in that cavity. And that tamponade is either by expansile gas or silicon oil. Gas is uh, sort of uh, expansile, so the, the pressure of the gas against the retina is what's providing the tamponade. Silicon oil is sort of something that can be in the eye longer because the gas would be absorbed over days to weeks depending upon the type of gas used. Silicon oil remains in the eye for longer, but the problem is silicon oil would need to be removed because silicon oil A, causes problems with vision formation because of its difference in refractive index from the vitreous. And it can also sort of seep into the anterior chamber and cause blockage of the anterior chamber angle. So it needs to come out. This is how the various instrument entered through the pars plana. We have an illuminator so that the surgeon could see what's happening in the eye. We have an infusion line that keeps the eye inflated as the vitreous is being cut. And we have a vitreous cutter. So you have illuminators. So we can have uh, two million illuminators in this case, an infusion line that keeps the eye sort of filled with fluid so that it has its tone. It still remains an eyeball, doesn't collapse and you have your vitrector, which is cutting away the vitreous. And then these are those lasers that are applied uh, around the brakes. And as you can see, there are two brakes and multiple rows of laser are applied around the brakes. Um, and here we go. Um, and these, these lasers are going to seal the RPE with the, fuse the RPE with the underlying choroid so that the, these brakes can no longer uh, allow fluid to seep through and cause a, a detachment. So the endolaser probe, the probe that applies these lasers, entered through the same port through which the cutter was, uh, cutter entered the eye from. The cutter is removed, 
uh, and the endolaser is introduced it's called endolaser because laser is being done from inside the eye this is the third stage the tamponar stage so you can use an expansile gas bubble or you can use a silicon oil if if you have a larger break but remember that the silicon oil would need to be removed uh, from the eye the third way of, of repairing a regmatogenous RD is called pneumatic retinopexy. Pneumatic retinopexy is popularized from the US. It's an outdoor procedure or an office procedure. It's also done in Pakistan and it's used to manage very small breaks. And it just involves direct injection into the vitreous cavity uh, through the power supply of an expansile gas. Uh, and that would flatten the retina and through its pressure also remove the subretinal fluid and also close the break and provide tamponade. It's an all-in-one thing because the break is so small and the surgeon is so sure that if he injects that bubble of air, that bubble is going to press against the retina, remove the fluid, seal the break, and also acts as a tamponade. Uh, and it needs to be a small break. It needs to be manageable by the air bubble. So this is the bubble which expands, closes the breaks, but before that, it is going to remove all the SRF close the break and also provide tamponade and with time as the as the break is uh, sealed the by that time the bubble is already gone in this picture uh, break is referred to as a tear a tear may also be called a hole so break tear hole a sort of all representing the same thing now we are going to talk about tractional retinal detachment a tractional retinal detachment is one that is caused by a formation of bands between the uh, vitreous and the retina. And again, the neural uh, retina separates from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium as these bands contract without actually creating a retinal break. This is again generally a unilateral condition. The age uh, is dependent upon the underlying risk factor or factors, but it's generally between 40 and 70 years. Uh, so the risk factors are vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous inflammation, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, other causes of new vascularization of the retina like uh, after vascular occlusions and trauma. So of all of these factors, what is basically happening is formation of those traction bands. And as long as you have traction band without a detachment, you are in a pre-detachment state uh, stage and the patient would present with flashes as the bands are pulling on the retina but haven't detached it here. Then you get to a detachment stage, which is again a sudden and painless loss of vision, which could be visual acuity or visual field or both, depending upon how much and which part of the retina is affected. And the RAPD will again only be seen if more than 55% of the retina is detached. And again, we have talked about why that is. Um, and if the fovea is not detached, obviously the visual acuity is going to be well preserved. If the fovea is detached together with the other area of the retina, the visual acuity together with the visual field would be affected. So these are two bands. This is a rather simpler band. This is a more sort of complicated traction band. And right now, uh, these this band right here is causing detachment. You can see the tenting of the retina right here. So the retina is being pulled up like a tent. Uh, again, here the retina is being pulled up like a tent. So these are traction bands causing tractional retinal detachment. And the management principle here is you need to cut these bands or dissect them away because you remove the traction, the retina would settle back because again, there are no holes. And obviously together with this, you need to manage the underlying cause as well because the bands might form again. So this is just a little video of showing how the bands are cut. And although it might look easy, this is the band being picked up by a forcep to separate it uh, and to identify which is the retina and which is the band. And this is the vitreous cutter, the same cutter to remove the vitreous and regmatogenous retinal detachment. And it is cutting away these bands. You have to be very careful to cut the band and not the retina because the retina is coming together with these bands. You can see some vitreous hemorrhages in the background, uh, some retinal hemorrhages in the background here as well. So once more being picked up, then being cut away. This is the illuminator. This is the optic disc. You have to be very careful that you're just cutting the band and not the retina. Finally, we will talk about exudative retinal detachment. And this is a type of retinal detachment that happens because of collection of fluid uh, between the neural retina and the RPE without any traction or without any breaks. And this happens because, uh, because of certain specific conditions that we'll just talk about. But because there is just fluid without any overlying breaks or any you know, traction, this fluid can simply move. So as the patient moves his or her head, 
the area of the detachment would move and the visual symptoms would also change their position, i.e. the visual loss would change depending upon where the fluid is and which part of the retina is detached. It can be unilateral, bilateral, and age age depending upon the underlying cause. It is strongly associated with malignant hypertension, specifically pheochromocytoma, which would make it young males, and eclampsia and preeclampsia, which would then make a female who is pregnant and may have presented with pregnancy-induced hypertension. So the patient is going to present with sudden painless loss of vision or visual field, and this is now shifting, as I just described before. And again, if at any one time more than 55% of the retina remains detached, you will get an RAPD. So this is a picture. Uh, these are not real retinas. And this is when the patient is sitting down, the fluid is in this area causing a sort of an inferior RD. But when the patient is lying supine, head up, the fluid has moved into a more superior place, uh, superior position, causing a superior RD. So the, as the posture changes, the pocket of fluid moves. This is just fluid below the neural retina and the detachment shifts, the visual symptoms shift. And this is a real picture of the retina. And these are two large areas of exudative RD. No breaks, uh, no bands. And the management is simply managing the underlying condition which actually led to the fluid being here. And managing those conditions would sort of improve the, or remove would remove the stimulus that is producing the fluids that is causing the, the, this type of detachment. Uh, so this, since this was our final uh, differential for sudden painless loss of vision, we have our table, our traditional table. And again, uh, I am just going to uncover these here. You can use the PowerPoint uh, that accompanies this video and you can use that at home. So as to uh, use this as a revision guide for yourself uh, so that you could learn to differentiate between these diseases based on the criteria given at the top. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll see you in your next video.